fact, we are doing science with Dr. Carl. Dr. Carl, not only do people hear us every single week, but this week they can see us as well. OMG. If you go to Triple J's YouTube channel, we are live streaming this science episode and you can leave us a little note in the chat. Maybe you've got a question that you want to put in the chat or a comment. We are open to it. So head to at Triple J on YouTube. Let's go. Hey, Dr. Carl, can you tell me one thing that you have learnt this week? Um, the chocolate milk doesn't go very well with tea. Why did you have to do this? Because we had run out of regular milk and we always have a cup of tea in the morning, my wife and I, and I got up early so I made her a cup of tea and I brought it to her in bed as well as the newspaper while the sun was just rising on the horizon. Oh. But we had run out of milk. There was only enough milk for her. But we'd had a birthday party for a two-year-old on a weekend and there was chocolate milk. And I had yesterday tried out the chocolate milk kind of does work with coffee. And to preserve the milk for my wife, I had chocolate milk with tea. Doesn't really work, but I don't think I'll do it again. But at least I found out that you can pour the chocolate milk into the tea. Exactly. You made that sacrifice. Was the consistency still the same as the tea as well? <sighs> so, so I like coffee and I like tea. And tea has a sort of a softer feeling. And here it got sort of... I'm trying to use words of the wine industry. I'm not going to say mm. cigar box or ocean floor, but it was sort of rounded and softer and I was missing the highlights of the tea. You need just a little bit of a bite from the tea mm. and that bite just got taken away by the chocolate milk. So the coffee would have been more of a mocha. Yeah, that's right. Mm. And whoever came up with that idea was wonderful because the thing is that the active chemical in caffeine is caffeine in coffee, which is 137 trimethylxanthine, but in chocolate, the active ingredient is 37, not 137, but 37, dimethylxanthine, and they're really very close to each other. The chemical in chocolate is called theobromine, named by Linnaeus himself, the god of uh, botany, as theo as in theology, god, bromine to drink, so it's a drink of the gods, and this has answered the great um, problem of the philosophers for the thousands of years, does God exist? Because one of those chemicals, caffeine, increases your blood pressure, and the other one, chocolate, reduces your blood pressure. So that proves that God exists, and if she does exist, she wants you to have chocolate every time you have coffee. It's obvious. So coffee is the drink of the gods, you said? Oh, theobromine. The, 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 that, that's the stuff in chocolate. Mm. That's a 3-7. Uh, that means that position number three and position number seven, there's a methyl group, and then a xanthine. It's like two rings of carbon atoms chucked together. I don't know what a xanthine is. It's that's science. chemistry stuff. Yeah, exactly. The chemistry of chocolate and coffee. We are getting your science questions 0439 75 755. We are kicking off with Luke in Cessnock. Luke, what's your question for Dr. Carl? Hi, hi, Doctor. Um, yeah, so I uh, dried out some chilies in the oven, and unfortunately, I, I normally do it, but I forgot this time and left them in there. They went black and um, smoked out the oven. No problems, I just threw them out. But the next time we went to use the oven, I think it was oven fish or something like that, the, the fish was infused with the chilli, it was so hot. Um, I just can't work out how the chilli would have got into the in, into the food. Hang on, you're saying that it was so hot. So it wasn't just that there was a hint of chilli in the fish, but rather it was It a was lot? intense. It was intense? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Was it intense enough <laughs> that you had to drink water? Really, what you should have is an oily drink uh, with a, a fat content like yogurt or something that will absorb the active ingredient from the chilli from your mouth. But did you have to drink water or something like that? Was it that I hot? I was I was okay because I, I love me chilies, but no, my wife, yeah, she was drinking the milk. <laughs> okay, the active ingredient in chilies is a chemical called capsaicin, C-A-P-S-A-I-C-I-N. Its intensity is measured in something called the Scoville scale, S-C-O-V-I-L-L-E. -E. Normal humans like you and me can probably get away with a couple of hundred or maybe a thousand. Uh, it goes up to 16 million, uh, pure capsaicin. Um, what I'm guessing is the following, that... Uh, as a result of previous uses of the oven, there was a thin layer, a thin layer of fat on the inside of the oven. The capsaicin evaporated, went into that layer, and then when the oven was heated up again, left that layer and went into the fish, which is, it was fish, you said? Yeah, and fish is extremely porous, and so it went into the fish. Um, wow. You could start a whole new trend of a new way of cooking where you infuse flavours into the food, food by overheating them in the oven. Infused oven, yeah. <laughs> Infused oven. Oh, yeah, man, you heard it here first. <laughs> Thanks, Luke. We've got Thank Ali in Canberra here. Dr. Ali, you've got a bit of a weird thing going on with your bath. What's up? 
Yeah, hi, Doctor. So um, we drew a bath at home the other day and it looked okay to begin with, but as the water got deeper, it turned a bluish tinge. And we're just wondering why that might be. Um, kind of did a bit of a Google and saw that it might be something like copper in the tap, mm-hmm. but it could also be the depth of the water. So I'm wondering if you know, yeah, why that might be. Also, Ali, what mm. colour is your bath? It's a white bath. Mm. So it's just a regular old white bath um, and came up with that blue tinge. I've noticed this in my parents' white bath as well, that the water has this bluish tinge. Dr. Carl? Uh, Ali, have you noticed this before? Have you drawn bars before and they have not been blue and then suddenly on this occasion it was blue? Is, is that the way it's working? Um, it's happened at least a couple of times, yeah. Okay, so water has a slight bluish tinge to it anyway, but you don't normally see it in something as shallow as a bathtub. Um but, but you're saying that it, it, this is consistent. Each time you draw the water to that depth, it, you do have a slight bluish tinge? Yeah, yep. I'm out of my depth here. I don't know whether it's an excess of copper. Normally copper is very inert and doesn't go into the water. There could be some sort of chemical activity going on. I think we need a plumber to advise <laughs> us here. It could be that you've got a mixture of iron and copper pipes. I don't know whether that would cause the copper to be released. Plumbers, without whom civilization would not exist, mm. ring in. The magic number is? Well, you can text 0439 We've got Huey in Melbourne here. Huey, you got a question about mirrors. Okay, uh, doctors. So my question is, if two mirrors face each other and only each other, what would like what would that show? What would it look like? Well, it depends upon the ambient light. So the light will go and land, it go through the glass. Your normal mirror has glass at the front and then it has an aluminium, or for our American listeners, aluminium, coating at the back. A little bit of the light is absorbed by the glass. So you might put in, say, a million photons and 999,000 come out, you know. But virtually all of it is reflected, but not all. Most is reflected at the aluminium layer. If there are no photons, it's going to be complete blackness. If you manage to generate a photon between the two of the two sheets of glass, it'll uh, it'll bounce backwards and forwards, and after a little while, it'll be absorbed and get turned into heat. And if you have a million of them, then gradually, the more times it goes backwards and forwards, more will be absorbed with each pass until you get nothing happening. There is a trick you can do where you have two mirrors at right angles, and you can get yourself um, a mirror where things are not opposite but the right way around. So you can show some print to them, and it'll come the right way around. But this is not that. So eventually the light will be absorbed by the imperfect reflection of the aluminium and also the glass will uh, absorb some of it. In astronomical mirrors, the aluminium is on the front because they don't want any distortion whatsoever from the glass. So it will get absorbed eventually if you get a photon or a bunch of photons. Is that that kind of what you're asking there? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Thanks, Huey. We are getting your questions coming through on 0439 757 but also on our live stream. The live chat is on now if you've got something you want to put to Dr. Carl or if you just want to leave him a little love note. Aww. That'd be nice, right? Yeah. You are listening to Science with Dr. Carl. We're going to take a track right here. We'll have more for you after this.
It's Vance Joy, one of these days on Triple J, in the midst of science with Dr. Carl. We are taking your science questions, but we're also live streaming on Triple J's YouTube channel. Uh, James saying, it's interesting to see the facial expressions of Dr. Carl when he's listening. And you are a very good listener, Dr. Carl. Yeah, one of the things I learned, which took me a long time, was that if you're dealing with somebody whose opinions you disagree with, the best thing you can do is to listen 100% actively and then... Before you try to put forward your argument, summarise their argument for them to ask them if you've got the, the, a good understanding of what they're saying. Mm. And that way you can diffuse situations and it suddenly turns away from a I'm right and I'm wrong and, and you're wrong and you're an idiot into what are we exactly talking about? So mm. actually trying to get down to the data. Like I'm hearing what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. That's an important thing. I only learned that yesterday. So we had a question earlier yeah. about bath water that appeared to be blue. Mm. You put the call out to see if there were any plumbers who would ah. know. Someone saying, my boyfriend is a plumber and said it's a mixture of the fluoride and chlorine in the water. Ah. Bronson in Hobart also saying, I've noticed that our bath water will appear more blue if the water is hotter. I'm assuming copper is released into the water in higher temperatures and someone else tank rainwater is often acidic and can make house water blue from copper pipes so a couple ah. of different angles which you already mentioned dr carl yeah and also um depending on where the chlorine is added into the system and how close you are to that that place your chlorine levels can be higher or lower so we do have to put chlorine into the water to kill the bugs it can cause bad things in microscopic levels, but overwhelmingly it's good to have chlorine in the water because that way the water is safe to drink. We've got Beth in the Sutherland Shire here. Dr. Beth, what's your question? Dr. Beth, come on down. Hi, Dr. Carl, Dr. Lucy. Um, I had a question about food intolerances and babies. Specifically, like, how do babies develop food intolerances or allergies? Like they're born with them, but they've been exposed to those things while they've been growing inside you. Um, for instance, I crave dairy with my son and he came out with a dairy intolerance. And I'm so curious as to how that can happen. Wow. Wow. Okay, so um, after a baby has been manufactured into a single fertilised egg, it starts to grow and grow and grow. And at some stage, it develops an immune system. And this immune system uh, has a job of killing everything it comes in contact with. And then there's another system that kills that part of the immune system that attacks you. So you've got this immature immune system, you haven't been born yet, and then you, we'll say you get exposed, it gets exposed to cells from the heart. And any part of the immune system that, doesn't, that reacts against the cells from the heart, it gets killed. And so gradually your immune system, having started off with hating you and, and wanting to kill everything, will try and kill everything except you. So when you're born, it accepts every part of your body. And some things go across from the mother, across the placenta to the baby, and they can go into the baby's circulation, and it goes both ways. And so the baby learns a bit of a tolerance to what's happening uh, with the mother's diet. And so if the mother likes curry, the baby will like yeah, tend to like curry. Now, the thing you're talking about, the baby being born. Now, let's get this straight. The, 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 your baby, is it a boy or a girl? It's a little boy. And, yeah, he's got a um, dairy intolerance. How old is he? He's four months. Was he intolerant? Is he intolerant to breast milk? Yes, he was. So he's on a special formula now. Okay. This is how it works. Okay. So uh, first thing is that... Um, in general, babies are born with an enzyme called lactase. You know it's an enzyme because it finishes with A-S-E. And it can break down the two bunches of carbon rings called lactose. So you've got lactose, two rings stuck together. They are too big to be absorbed across the gut wall. If they sit there in the gut, uh, they will absorb water from the gut, you'll get diarrhea, the squirts, all that sort of stuff. So you have to have this enzyme called lactase to break down the lactose, which is full of nutrition, into two, into, into two separate rings. And all babies, practically, are born with this ability and they lose it two, three, five years of age. And just a little diversion here, 7,000 years ago in Hungary, there was a mutation that adults could now break down 
lactose that they could make lactase as adults. And this mutation spread across the world, and now one-third of the world have this mutation, and they can drink a milkshake and get nutrition from it, but two-thirds don't. In your case, I think, but I'm not sure, that there's a genetic mutation that they don't make lactase. Did the did you see the geneticist at the local kids' hospital about this? No, we've just been managing through our GP. It is worthwhile just to get that attention, put yourself on the queue, because uh, they do know stuff that you and I don't know, and they'll be able to say, oh, by the way, this might happen later on in life, uh, or if your baby has this mutation, this might happen later, or it might not be a mutation at all. It could be due to some infection. I'm way out of my depth here, but I'd definitely recommend going to see an immunologist at a, the local kids' hospital. We've got Jack here. Dr. Jack, what's your question for Carl? Yeah. Hi, Dr. Jack, come on down. Jack, you there? Stop talking to everybody else. We want to talk to you. We love you, Jack. All come right. on, Jack. I don't think okay. Jack is tuned in right now. No. We've got a Jason in Port Botany. Dr. Jason? Dr. Jason, you've got a question about lightning. What's up? Hi, doctors. Um, I drive a big container fork out of Botany, and my question is, if I get hit by lightning while attached to a stack of shipping containers, am I not going to get fried? Uh, yes and no. But first thing, you don't want to get hit by lightning. If you live, overwhelmingly, people have troubles ranging from mild to severe for the rest of their lives. So think about lightning hitting a tree... And then it runs through the thin layer of water on the tree. And if you happen to be sheltering under that tree, you want to hope that that tree has a smooth bark. It has a smooth bark, so the water forms a thin layer of the entire trunk all the way down to the ground, and the lightning will run through that layer of water harmlessly into the ground. But if the tree has a rough bark there'll be a dry patch and look around for something to jump onto and it'll jump onto you. In the same way, you're looking at that sort of situation with lightning on the uh, fork. Do you call it a fork? Yeah, it's the master of the fork, yeah. Yeah, fork. I, I like the way you call them just a fork. In <laughs> fact, I've, I've often desired when I've been stuck in a traffic jam that my vehicle would turn into a forklift truck and then I could just go <laughs> ahead, lift up the vehicle in front of me, put off the side <laughs> and just stuff my way through the traffic that way. Okay, enough of that fantasy. So with a bit of luck, you should be in a metal cage that yep. is um, – totally metal all the way around. You can have a little bit of a break at the side like a glass window, but if it's mostly metal, then the light, lightning will pass through the body of the forklift truck, through the layer of water on the tyres and into the ground. Overwhelmingly, you should be safe. But there have been occasions where the lightning just jumps onto a person inside the vehicle, but that's very rare. The vehicle forms what's called a Faraday cage. You should be safe, but we really need to talk to an electrical engineer to know more. I hope that, and thank you for providing Good for us here in Australia. You're very kind. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. We've got Jack here. Jack, what's your question? Uh, Dr. Carl, question for Dr. Carl. Um, I, I've been talking to a lot of people about the, uh, you know, the lately there's been a lot of climate records tumbling, mm -hmm. and I've been talking to people about all of that, you know, um, just need for action. And uh, But I'm hitting this objection with some people the, about, you know, that, that there's no d trust in science. And I want to talk to them about the scientific method, exactly what it is. Could wow. you explain the scientific method, what it's based on, and why we should believe scientists? Well, you use the word believe. Uh, so let me run, let me give you an example. Um, at the university I am at, at Witness School of Physics, University of Sydney, we had one of the top relativists in the Southern Hemisphere. That's somebody who knows and understands uh, relativity, who also was a minister of religion. And so one part of their brain said, I'm not going to accept anything unless it's backed up by data and hard empirical evidence, and I want some sort of mathematical model. And the other part of his brain was, I don't need no proof, I just believe. Science needs proof. The mathematical method, oh, sorry, the scientific method, is that you go for data and then you, from that, you build up a model or theory, and then, or sorry, a model, and then you try to see if it fits the past, and then whether you can make predictions about the future. And if it falls over, then you throw it away. The motto of the scientist is that I hold my theories on the mere tips of my fingers. So the merest breath of wind, sorry, I'll hold my 
yeah, my theory is on the tips of my fingers, so the near, merest breath of new fact will blow them away. And so you've been following this theory, the steady state theory is how the universe began, along comes a new data, you just toss it out. So with regard to, the sci- with regard to climate change, 1973, the insurance company started charging more, beginning with Munich Re, for extre- areas where there were extreme weather events. They, that was enough proof for them that they had from their records in 1973. In 1977, the fossil fuel companies, uh, James Black, the chief scientist for Exxon, said there's something going on. In 1980, the fossil fuel companies said, OK, we're going to have a look at it. And they, they funded the world's best climate science in the 1980s. Um, and they got all sorts of data. And in 1982, at a meeting on the 12th of November, and you can see the slide, they predicted what would happen 38 years Years later, if they did business as usual, and they predicted that the carbon dioxide would go to 415 parts per million and that the um, temperature would go up by one degree in 1982. Now, the climate scientists were still not convinced because they had their models and it was owned, and they, they put the, the current data into the models and they said, okay, let's see what happens by the time we get to 85, uh, 88, and 90. And by 1990, they had what they called the signal. They said, we've had our models for about eight years. All the data we're putting in fits in with these models because we've seen them evolve. And the predictions we made in 1982, 81, et cetera, are now coming through. And they called it the signal. And I went on to the Midday Show to talk about this in 1990. I did my first story on climate change in Double J in 1981. Wow. And we're still denying it. Well, okay, the the fossil fuel companies have been denying it since 1990, um, but then the tobacco companies deny that tobacco is bad for your health. And so to the second part of Jack's question, why should we believe what scientists say? Do you reckon you can speak to that or yeah. do you think it's just... So it's not so much believe, but it's just the history that they make these predictions and they come true and they make an aeroplane and with their engineering and physics, they say it won't fall out of the sky and it doesn't. And they say that they'll make a car and it'll do this. It's just the 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 overwhelming history of making predictions and having them come true. We've got a quick question from Renee on our live stream asking, a healthy gut is known to assist with mental health. Are there any foods that may quickly relieve symptoms of anxiety? Anxiety. Claire Collins has something on this. Go and look up The Conversation. Claire Collins, C-L-A-R-E, Chewing. Mm. And you'll find that homepage on the conversation. And she talks about how chewing, the act of chewing, has been shown not just to help you get rid of earworms. Isn't that weird? <laughs> because the same part of the brain that deals with repetitive movements in, uh, in the music and you're processing it also is uh, used for chewing. And so if you chew, you can make an earworm go away. Ah. And it turns out that, go look at that study and she says that there are uh, specific the act of chewing can help relieve anxiety, either chewing gum or just foods. And I've done a podcast on this, so search um, shirtloads of science and you'll see I interviewed her about this whole chewing thing. It blew my mind that chewing could help relieve anxiety. Oh, my God. And also um, when we had our conversation with her as well, when she joined us for Science a few weeks back, she said, so many of our foods now are so soft that you need to be able to eat foods that have a bit of a crunch to them, that can actually give you that bite. It's really interesting. You can go back through the podcast feed and have a listen. If you do have a question, you can hit us up on our live stream right now or, of course, 0439 757 We'll have more science after this. Since 1989, we've been asking you to tell us your favourite songs to decide the hottest 100. Hottest. That's millions of painstakingly chosen votes, should have been hires, and unforgettable parties with your mates. Woo! Now you can hear the music that soundtracks your life from festivals to breakups, late nights and firsts whenever you want. Introducing Triple J Hottest, a brand new radio station. Listen 24 hours whenever you want for heaps of music you voted in the Hottest 100 countdowns. It's just the hottest songs. It all kicks off Monday, July 17 at 9.30am on the Triple J app. Just swipe across to Hottest.
It is the official song for the FIFA Women's World Cup. Oh, Benny and Mulrat coming together on Do It Again. We are chatting science with Dr. Carl and Hector in Melbourne. You've texted it in saying interesting about the chewing. Dr. Carl, we said that chewing can relieve anxiety. And Hector said, if I feel nervous before boxing sparring, I always have a chewy and feel confident again. I always thought it was just my little thing. Wow, big it up for Professor Claire Collins. Okay, we've got Marley right here in Port Augusta. Marley, what is your question for Carl? Hi, Dr. Carl. How does a snake make venom without killing that snake? Ah, because it keeps it in a special compartment. Now, you might have heard of the three foods, fats, proteins and carbohydrates, the three macronutrients. Well, snake venom is mainly made up of proteins and, in fact, enzymes. And what they're good at is dissolving the local flesh or tissue and running it along what we call the tissue planes between the top of the skin and the middle of the skin, the middle of the skin and the bottom of the skin. And so the venom can, in fact, do damage to the snake, but it's kept inside a compartment that is lined with something impervious and it won't leak through. And then it'll come out along a channel and out through the teeth, through little holes, and then go into the victim. And then the enzymes will liquidize, kind of mush up the flesh, and then that will then make it more easy for the snake to catch it and then eat it, depending on how it goes about it. Is that kind of helping you a bit? Is that the kind of answer yeah, you want to Yeah, also. Hmm? Yep. Also, I've got another question with that. Mm-hmm. If a snake bit another poisonous snake, would that snake die or not? Uh, yes. Now, look, I, I, I don't want to be pedantic, so I will. Poison is something that you take in through your mouth, whereas venom is something that comes through your skin. Oh. So you don't talk about snakes as being poisonous but venomous. It's a very tiny point. We got out of the way. So, But if a snake were to bite itself or another venomous snake of the same species, in many cases, it would not have adapted to that and it could kill it, the other snake or itself. In some cases they can survive, but mostly they won't. Hectic. Thanks, Marley. Thank you. Marley? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, by the way, if it is a herpetologist, please ring in uh, to amplify my answer because I've used, used about up my entire knowledge on that field. You nailed it, though. We've got Steve from Doreen here. Steve, you've got a question yes. about the sun, the earth, the link between. What's up? Yeah. Um, first of all, just like to say thanks for spreading the knowledge every week. Um, you're, making, you're making the world a bit more interesting and hopefully a better place for everybody. Oh, Lucy, uh, we've done our work. We've done it. Thanks, oh, Steve. Thank you. You do every week, yeah. Um, yeah, my question, just um, the sun's so hot. I mean, I don't know the numbers. You probably do, Carl. Um, and that, that spreads heat to our planet. Um, mm-hmm. And you know that I've heard you mention those numbers again, so many kilowatts per square metre. Um, but why is the space between the sun and the earth then so cold? Ah, the uh, temperature and heat are two different things. Temperature is a measure of how fast the molecules are moving. So at one stage we had a tokamak nuclear reactor or fission reactor, a fusion reactor at the University of Sydney, and we could heat up things to temperatures of 15 million degrees. But the number of molecules that were heated to that temperature were not many, and so the total amount of heat which is different from temperature, the total amount of heat was not enough to boil an egg. Oh. Right? So in the, so the temperature between at the surface of the sun is 5,700 degrees. And so along its way, that heat will be transferred to some molecules that happen to be there. But there's, I think it's of the order inside the solar system of five molecules of, hyd- uh, of hydrogen, typically, per square per cubic centimetre. In the Earth's atmosphere, it's one followed by 19 zeros, but in space, it's only five. And so those individual molecules will get hot, but there's not many of them. So the temperature is high, but there's not much heat there. Okay, so it needs a molecular reaction and and because there's few molecules in space, it's not going to happen. Well, you're not going to get any significant 
Hey, so if you go out there in your spacesuit, oh yeah, with, with spacesuit, did did you see the movie Gravity? With yes, who was it? Sandra ago, Bullock. Yeah. yeah, okay. At one stage, she climbs out of her, her spacesuit when she's landed, and and she jumps into the lake, and everything's all, all right. Mate, what they left out was the fact that the inside of her spacesuit is lined with a hundred meters of water pipe. What? So when an astronaut is in space. One side, 100 metres, one side of their spacesuit is getting heated up to about 300 degrees centigrade. So there's 5,700 coming in, and in a short period of time it'll get up to about 300, and the other side is at minus 200. And to equalise the temperature, they've got 100 metres or so of water pipe and a pump going chugga, 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 taking the heat from the hot side to the cold side. So she, in the middle... Um, it doesn't get too hot or too cold. Equalised. But to make it easy for the movie, she just takes off a spacesuit and you don't see the messy 100 <laughs> metres or so of water pipe. I think it's about 80 metres, actually. Mm, we'll allow that for creative licence. Uh, thanks, Riley. Thank you, Dr Riley. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Steve. 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 <laughs> sorry, Steve. Sorry, <laughs> sorry <laughs> Thanks, Steve. guys. You've blown my mind once again. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we've got Riley here. That's what That's I was Riley. looking at. Riley from Ngunnawal oh, Country. you got a question about sharks. Yeah, I do. So, um... Hello, doctors. Good morning. Dr. Um, Dr. Riley. I found out recently that sharks evolved before trees did, and mm. that absolutely blew my mind. So I'm hoping Dr. Carl can explain how <laughs> or why. <laughs> okay, so uh, brief history of life. Planet began 4.5 billion years ago. Single cell creatures appeared 3.8, and they stayed from as single cell creatures from 3.8 billion years ago to about 1 billion years ago. And then we evolved into multi-celled creatures that had some cells for the kidney and the liver and the heart or whatever it was. And then about 540 million years ago, we had the so-called pre-Cambrian explosion, which was just saying diversity happened. We're not too sure why, but just everything became incredibly diverse and all sorts of life forms happened. But here's the important point. Only in the oceans. Mm. Now, the numbers are a bit rough, but sharks evolved around 420 million years ago. 400 million years ago, life, plant and animal, began to move onto the land. And trees are 385. So if, you, if you're going for that magic number of, say, roughly 400, sharks were already there at 420 million years back, and trees, 385, uh, because the land was, we think they were fungi and sort of tr trees of fungus, but they weren't trees that we know them today. So starting off in the ocean gives you an advantage because that's where life began. Amazing. Yeah. Incredible. Do we know how old the oldest shark is? Oh, uh, back in time, 420-ish four, million years. But there's something about sharks in northern parts of the world near Iceland. I'm hearing figures of – if somebody can help me, my memory's really bad on this – 900 years old. What? I, I, no, no way. It, could, it couldn't be. Like, uh, tortoises are up the maximum around 450. But there was something about sharks being a couple of hundred years old. If somebody could – text in that number because I don't have time to look it up. I'd be very grateful. That's crazy. Thanks, Riley. Thank you. Thank Absolutely you, incredible. Riley. Oh, We've I had a question earlier from Ali in Canberra about the case of the blue bath water. Yes. We're still getting texts in about this. Um, someone's saying cool white LED lights have high percentages of blue light so white baths can see more blue combined with ah. other chemical factors that are more obvious than the cool white LED lights. Someone else, as an analytical chemist, I can say that water itself is actually blue. It will both absorb red and infrared more than blue whilst also scattering blue light more more as the light travels through it. So in the dozens of litres in a bath, there is enough water to observe the effect as it, transmit, it transmits and reflects back off the white bath. Ah, thank heavens for chemistry. Honestly. We've got Kate in Melbourne here. Kate, what's your question for Carl? I am wondering, Dr Carl, why my boyfriend always gets belly button fluff, only when he wears T-shirts, not uh, shirts. And, ah. And where did it come from? Are the T-shirts tight or loose? Just loose, regular cotton T-shirts. Ah. In general, belly button fluff is made up of two sets of fibres, which are fibres from the clothing, because in the clothing, they're sort of woven over each other, up, down, up, down, left, right, left, right. They're not welded in. They're not glued in. So it's fibres mm -hmm. of clothing and hair fibres 
depending on how hairy the abdomen is, then held together by dead skin cells. Does he have a hairy abdomen or is this an indelicate question to ask? <laughs> kind of, not super hairy, but okay, more but hairy the thing than is mine, that, thankfully. Okay, but the thing is that it happens with the T-shirts. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing not that if you're the wearing a button-up shirt. I'm, I'm guessing that the T-shirts are shedding more fibres of clothing. That's my guess. Mm. Now, in general, the uh, and I'm a world expert on belly button fluff. I've won <laughs> an Ig Nobel Prize for it, uh, for which Harvard flew me. Harvard University. They flew me to Harvard and gave me accommodation entirely at my own expense. Uh, and uh, accommodation and flights, they, uh, they wouldn't pay for it because that would be an insult for this how prestigious a prize the Ig Nobel <laughs> Prize was, which was a set of red wind-up chittering teeth on a stick, uh, which was glued to a tile written in not even permanent text, but it rubbed off, so I had to top it up a little bit later. Oh. But the point is with the belly button fluff, um, along the way we discovered uh, the case of a young woman who was entirely hairless on her abdomen and used to generate lots of belly button fluff. Now, the average generator of belly button fluff is a slightly overweight, middle-aged male with a hairy abdomen. She was none of these, but she used to wear really tight T-shirts and generate lots of belly button fluff until, wait for it, she put a ring into her navel. And the ring acted like a little tent pole. And it held the T-shirt up. And the migrating fibres of the T-shirt couldn't make their way into that last bit to go into the belly button. And so she went to no belly button fluff once she had a navel ring. So I don't have a good answer, but it's a complicated topic and maybe I'll get another trip to Harvard out of it. Yeah, absolutely. At my own expense. Yeah, with a, what, a fake trophy that they made? Oh, it was real. A uh, real trophy? Uh, yeah, was, yeah, like the, the red chatter, chattering wind-up teeth oh, yeah, that you wind yeah, up with. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 those things, yeah. <laughs> Kate, thanks for your question. And a lot of people following up about the oldest shark. People yeah. saying, James, Greenland sharks, at least 250 years, right. but expected to be over 500 years. 200? years they guaranteed and over 500 that's older than tortoises crazy wow. we are answering your science questions here on science with dr carl we're also live streaming as well unfortunately you won't be able to hear this music break because copyright ah. legal will come for us but take a breather if you've got a comment or a question chuck it in the live chat or text us 0439 75 Need gigs? Get amongst these. Get up and about because Splendour in the Grass is days away. Catch your fave acts like Lizzo, Flume, Hilltop Hoods, Tuve Lu, Arlo Parks, Peach PRC and so many more. Get onto your group chats and make your way to North Byron Parklands because it's going to be big. Plus, Listen Out has hit us with a huge lineup. Catch sets from Ice Spice, Skrillex, Morat, Kenny Beats, Lil Uzi Vert, and many more. Brisbane, Perth, Melbourne, and Sydney, get ready. And if you're in Adelaide, you'll be treated to listen in with Skrillex, RD, Lil Uzi Vert, and more. And don't forget about Spilt Milk, Springtime, and Yours and Ours. For info on these besties and more, hit the touring tab on the Triple J website.
DMAs, get ravey. Right here on Triple J, in the midst of science with Dr. Carl, we are getting into your science questions last round. Sam in Wiradjuri, what is your question? Hi, doctors. Dr. Sam. Um, I, hi, I have a question about the stars that we can see. Mm-hmm. So obviously I have learned over time, and you'll probably correct me because I could be wrong, that the stars that we currently see are actually dead. So my question is, how come we can see them? How long will we be able to see them for? Ah, so some of the stars we can see are dead and some are not. So with regard to the sun, uh, it's still burning. It's 620 million tonnes of hydrogen every second. uh, And it takes that light only eight minutes to get to us. So I can't guarantee that the sun is alive now, but I know it was alive eight minutes ago. But it could have died. <laughs> in that, okay. And so the nearest stars, four light years away, so um, after they die, it'll take us four years to know. So imagine that a, a star is like pun- punching out some bullets. And these bullets carry the information about the light, and they travel at the speed of light. So yes. it pumps out the bullets, and if a star blows up, the bullets, or the photons of light still keep coming for us, and then they'll come past us. And, and okay. that's the moment when we can see them, and then they, they keep on going, and then we can't see those particular photons. So long as the photons of light are coming at us, we can see it. Mm. And so there's a famous star called Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse, which is really big, um, so big that if it was in our solar system, it would swallow up Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And it's going to blow up sometime real soon by real soon, anything from tomorrow to you know, a, a thousand years. And it might have already blown up. I think it's 600 light years away. So if it blew up 600 years ago and one day, then uh, we'll see it blow up tomorrow because the light, uh, the light takes mm. 600 years to get to us. Mm. So, it's so like what a about time the day. constellations we can see, like the saucepan? And ah, okay, some of yeah. those stars are really close. So in a constellation, even though you call it the saucepan or the bear, the bear, some of the stars might be four light years away, or they could be 400, or they could be 4,000, which means that the light will take either four years to get to us or 4,000. But to us, we can't tell whether they're really close or far away. They just make a pretty pattern in the sky. I like that, Betel use. Well, let's, I, I don't know if I've got the correct pronunciation. <laughs> uh, we've got Derek in Melbourne. Derek, 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 you've got a question about sea levels. Hey, yeah, I heard that the sea level is actually not the same level all around the world and in some places can vary by as much as 100 metres. Is Dead it, right, is it 100 metres, yeah. The Indian Ocean is famous for it. Uh, about a decade ago, we set up a pair of satellites called GRACE, and the G stands for gravity and everything else I've forgotten. They're two satellites going around the Earth about 100 kilometres apart, and they're sending radar beams down to the ground and back up and measuring the height above the ground, but they're also bouncing beams off each other, and they're measuring how far apart they are. And if one of them goes above an area of more gravity it'll dip down maybe a millimetre, and we can measure that. And so we've made this map, and it turns out that the Indian Ocean has an area maybe half the size of Australia, which is 100 metres below sea level, and that's because the gravity there is less. And we've managed to map that to plumes coming up of, of molten rock coming up from halfway down to the centre and rising to the surface, and these plumes are hot and they're less dense, and so there's less mass, and so the water doesn't get pulled in as far. So it's the lower gravity that means that the ocean has a dip of about 100 metres. Wow. I was astonished wow. when I read that last week. Thanks, Derek. Thank you, Dr. Derek. Thank you. So we have one final live stream question from Jason, wondering yep. why does my microwave interfere with Bluetooth signals like earbuds and my headset connected to my game console? It shouldn't. The shielding should be good enough. Because, and the reason it interferes is that the frequency is the same. Now, the frequency of Bluetooth and Wi-Fi is around two and a half 
gigahertz. Giga means billion. There are other frequencies used as five gigahertz, but let's just say that most of them are two and a half. And that, by coincidence, is the frequency that your microwave blasts out on. Now, the amount of radiation coming out is almost certainly totally safe and very, very low, but the signals in Bluetooth are very, very low as well. So that tiny amount of leakage, which will not harm you, except to maybe warm you up a fraction of a millionth of a degree, can interfere. What you can do with your home Wi-Fi system is choose different frequencies. Mm. There's a whole bunch of frequencies. You can choose, choose higher ones or lower ones. I've written a story about this. Look up ABC, Dr. Carl, microwave oven. And then with Bluetooth, I don't know if you can play with the frequencies. You might be able to uh, find a handy IT geek and ask them for advice. They'll be able to help you. Well, I thought you were my friendly IT geek. I only know enough to ask, to know that I need to ask a microwave geek, <laughs> uh, an IT geek. I, I know where the, the, the name of the person or the job of the person to ask to help get me out of trouble. Oh, yeah, you know the next step. Yeah, yes. I know the next step, but I don't know the step after that. Oh, that's all right. Dr. Carl, thank you so much for answering our science questions, both people texting in and everyone on the live stream as well. Thank you Hello, so much Hello, for watching and hanging out with us. Love you very much. Love everything you've ever done, audience, and everything you ever will do. You're my bestie. We're obsessed. Apart from you. Oh, apart from me, apart of course. From you, yeah. uh, I'm Lucy, Dr. Carl, with you again next week. Dave Woodhead up next, taking you through lunch. And you can listen back on the Science with Dr. Carl podcast. This is Mahalia with Terms and Conditions. You are listening to Triple J.